Welcome to the Asylum. And now, your hosts, Rick Flieger and Rick Briggs. Welcome to the Asylum Fantasy Sports Show. Now a proud member of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. Check out this and countless other great fantasy sports podcasts over at FullTimeFantasy.com. And, of course, on the tweeters, at Full-Time Fantasy. And, as always, you can follow the Asylum of AsylumFantasySports.com, at Asylum Football on Twitter. And if you want to be a part of the show, ask any questions, tell Briggs off, whatever you want to do, AsylumFootball at gmail.com. Rick, draft season is upon us. Head on over to FullTimeFantasy.com to participate in the free Best Ball World Championships. $35 starter leagues, the $299 online championship with a $50,000 grand prize. That's even big money to somebody as opulent as Rick Briggs. <laughs> and, of course, the 8th annual world championship out in Las Vegas, Rick. Take what you learn here and on this network and turn it into some real cash, fulltimefantasy.com. That is absolutely correct. We are Flieger and Briggs. This is the Asylum Sports Show right here on the Full Time Fantasy Podcast Network. And like you said, Rick, it is draft season now. Training camp's here. The, the casualties are already oh. starting to mount up. And uh, a lot to talk about just injury-wise. Yeah, yeah, we, we could do a whole show on that. We'll, we'll pick and choose the highlights with the, the holdouts, the injuries, the scary. And I don't think you can go anywhere, Rick, without having the Ezekiel Elliott conversation, who while the Cowboys are in training camp, he's in Cabo <laughs> looking for that new contract. Jerry Jones getting a little bit chesty right now, saying you don't need the number one running back to win a championship. This one feels different to me, Rick. We'll talk about Melvin Gordon next. By and large, I tend to agree, but Ezekiel Elliott and this Cowboys team, this feels like a different case to me where this team's in big trouble if they don't get something worked out with Zeke. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, in most cases, you would agree, but in most cases, you don't have Ezekiel Elliott for a running back, which accounts for probably 40% of your offense. Um, so yeah, I mean, this guy's special and I don't know what the details are, what he's looking for, but he, went, he wants Todd Gurley money and when, with everything going on with Todd Gurley, you can understand the reticence right. of the Cowboys, yeah. right? But right. You're not going to get Todd Gurley money, but you would think that Jerry Jones in this crucial time of the year, which is training camp. They should be talking with Elliot's agent. Counter, throw something out there, and, and well, I'd see like if, to assume they're doing that. I mean, some some I are claiming you, there are no talks. But well, well, do you? I mean, when you come out and say, "Well, you know, you don't need a great running back right. to win a Super Bowl," you know, are they talking? We don't really know. Um, and, and that's the concerning part in my mind because Ezekiel Elliott. We talked about this in previous shows. This isn't same this isn't melvin gordon no no where, where the chargers i think although their chances diminish somewhat i still think that they are a legitimate contender without melvin gordon you take zeke elliott off of the cowboys i don't even know if they contend for the division no and, and that's the thing it's such a he's such a special player but but melvin gordon there's a lot of running backs who are special players the difference is the importance of Ezekiel Elliott to that Cowboys offense, the way that offense is built. Look, Dak Prescott needs to get paid, too. Dak Prescott is not, in terms of a true quarter, a top 10 quarterback in this league. This is a build around his abilities, limited as they may be, in my opinion, the offensive line, and Ezekiel Elliott. Everything runs through him. So, in general, the way the league is going, yes. The ha the running back, having the star running back, is nowhere near as important as we once thought it was. The analytics of the whole thing, right, say you're better off throwing it 60 times even if you get picked off three or four times. Analytically, you're still better off throwing a ball. But that's not how this team is built. So, taking this hard like Now, look, I get it. He's got two years left on his contract. I just wonder if, if this is a delayed tactic you know honestly I just can't anticipate look Jerry Jones has played this game before what was it about 20 
25, 30 years ago, he played this game with Emmett Smith. Emmett Smith holds out, was it two games or three? I think it was only two. Two games, they go 0-2, get their teeth kicked in. All of a sudden, Jerry said, all right, well, maybe we'll go ahead and pay Emmett, and they go on to win a Super Bowl. This is the way that team is built. You have got to, got to have Ezekiel Elliott. You bring in Alfred Morris, that's going to that's gonna solve the problem. <laughs> right. Look, he's a nice guy and a good running back for a lot of years in the NFL. Come on now. Just, just come on. Dak Prescott isn't that dude even with Amari Cooper down there, that's going to lead that offense to do what they need to do with just another guy at running back. This has to get done, and that's why the fact that it has to, I'm probably less worried about this than a lot of other folks because Jerry Jones knows it, Zeke knows it, everybody in the Cowboys organization, everybody knows this has to get done or you're going to win six games this year. Exactly. Excuse me. You're talking about um, Alfred Morris coming in. You know, in perspective, if I if you were a cowboy fan or a fantasy fan, whatever, and I told you, well, we're going to replace Ezekiel Elliott with T.J. Yeldon, how excited about that are you? Not, not, not very. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is where you're at right now, and they need they well not need you, they have to get this done. You're absolutely right. And it's kind of funny when the owner comes out and says, you don't need a great running back to win a Super Bowl, when in fact the Super Bowls they won, they had Emmitt Smith. Yeah, you had the, you had the all-time leading rusher yeah, on your football team. By the numbers, team. the greatest of all time. That's very debatable, I get you, but by the numbers, <laughs> the greatest of all time. Well, in the conversation, whether, yeah. I mean, you're splitting hairs at, at that you know, when you're talking about that. But, yes, you have a great running back on your squad when you won those Super Bowls. And, and I dare say, how many Super Bowl winning teams weren't near the top of the league in rushing? Now, you think, okay, well, the Patriots. Guess what? They ran the football a ton. Yeah, I'm wondering. New Orleans runs the football a ton. Yeah, I'm wondering collectively what their Patriots number look like. What their final—that's that, a lot of research. What their final, you know, RB ranking was in the years they won those. Suits. But look, all of it aside, here's the bottom line. Again, it's just the way that team's built. And you look at what else is there. Dak Prescott, you know, very hot button guy. Right? Look, he's a good quarterback. He's a good NFL quarterback. But he's not the put the offense on my shoulder lead the charge, Aaron Rodgers, Ben Roethlisberger, Phil Rivers type of guy. He's not that guy. He, he's perfect for that offense, I believe. I like Dak Prescott a lot, but he's not going to lead that team to a Super Bowl. After Ezekiel Elliott, a lot of people talking, you know, the buzz in the fantasy communities around Tony Pollard. You know, really? Tony yeah. Pollard? May, he ain't Zeke. He may be right. fine. He'll be he'll be an RB two in fantasy if Zeke holds out for the year, maybe even a high end RB two, but he ain't gonna be Zeke. Amari Cooper, great. Then what? Michael Gallup, Randall Cobb, Jason yeah. Witten, who's a week and a half older than you. I, I mean, this offense is built around Zeke, so it just sure. feels like a game of chicken. Zeke's gonna get a couple more weeks of vacation down there in Cabo. Jerry's going to puff, puff his chest out, and he's going to send his son to the Wolves. You know, he'll get the deal done and then send his son out there to look like the idiot, you know, what Jerry was trying to – I could be dead wrong. I just don't see how, if you're the Cowboys, you can let this happen. You're going to have to overpay and take that cap hit. You have to. Yeah, I agree. And there's there's just no choice in the matter if, if they want to stay competitive, and it's just as simple as that. By the way, the Patriots just last year were fifth in the NFL in rushing. Right. Yeah, I mean, Sony Michelle and James White kind of split the duties, but it was basically Sony Michelle's gig. Um, and they run the football a lot. Right. Yeah. And the Dallas Cowboys are going to have to run the football a lot, or they're not going to win, like you said, I don't think over five or six games. Now, on the other hand, you head to L.A., you head to the Chargers. As a fantasy owner, I'm nervous about Melvin Gordon. Because I don't think he has the leverage, anywhere near the leverage, that an Ezekiel Elliott has. You've got good backs behind him. Eckler, who's had some success. Jackson, who has had some success in Gordon's absence. You have that guy who can put an offense on his shoulders in Phillip Rivers. You have 
a strong tight end core. You have a strong wide receiver core. I think Gordon, he's the best of the bunch, but I think you can plug plug Jackson in there. I think Eckler stays in his role as the, the change of pace is the other guy. I think Jackson come in there and produce at – close to or near, if not the same, as a Melvin Gordon would. So if Melvin Gordon's taking a hard line, I almost anticipate a Le'Veon Bell situation here with Melvin Gordon. You know, you look back at 2018, um, Melvin Gordon had less than 70 more carries than Austin Eckler did last year. Right. He had 69 more attempts. He had a 5.1 rushing average. Eckler had a 5.2. Uh I'm not now, saying he's as good as Gordon, but I they're not going in the tank like Dallas is. Now that's Number it. one, Gordon's not Ezekiel Elliott, no, no. and Austin Eckler isn't Alfred Morris. Okay? <laughs> right, yeah. Now, that said, Eckler, I believe, averaged less than three yards a carry in the four games Melvin Gordon was out. It was Josh Jackson who put up the number. Uh, I think the point being, Eckler needs to be that change of pace guy. You're not, not going to install him. All right, Austin Eckler's now our number one running back. Right. He needs to be the other dude. But they can move the ball in that role. Eckler is great. Jackson is just fine. So, uh, again, it feels like you, know, you haven't heard much recently from Melvin Gordon. He's taken a hard line. I'm going to get paid. If I'm the Chargers, I don't think I do it. I, I hate to say that. I'm all for all of these guys getting paid. I don't think I do it. Well, I would I would pay Melvin Gordon, but not what Melvin Gordon thinks well, he's well, going certainly. to get. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I would say, okay, you know, let's – Pay him in the top five running backs of the league yeah, right now. Yeah, let, let's but sit down or let's be reasonable, Melvin, because this is what it is, and this is where you stand, and – if you want to compare stats, we can do that too. But, you know, we have to be reasonable as well. I mean, you also you have Phillip Rivers who, like you said, needs to get paid. Keenan Allen needs to get paid. And there's a lot of other guys on that team that need to get paid as well. Right. So, you know, Melvin Gordon, I think, really needs to take a step back. He doesn't have a lot of leverage here. I don't. Not with the Chargers. I don't think so. Now, I think that his deal's different, his service time. I, I get the impression – he can sit out the entire year and still become a free agent. It's, I, it was so convoluted. I tried to write, jot it down so we could discuss. I didn't even understand it, but his situation's very different than, than like an Elliott's, even on that mm-hmm. side of things. You know what angered me the most about this? When when asked about it and Philip Rivers made those comments that essentially equated to, yeah, we're, we'd love to have Melvin here, but, but we're pretty good with who we have in the room. Everybody losing their mind. Oh, see, Melvin Gordon, you know, right. Phil Rivers won't go to bat. Or, or Phil Rivers is a bad, you know, union brother and a right. bad teammate. What did you expect Philip Rivers to say? Oh yeah, we're screwed. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, right. we won't we're win done. a game. We're not I'm, capable. I'm yeah. just going to go make another baby and not even play because right. this is worth it. What's he? What's a guy supposed to say? And you know what? It's the truth. They are okay without him. They're not as good without no. him. But they're they're just fine offensively. They'll find ways. But what did you expect the dude to say? Come I agree. On. And, and this contract thing. You know, I actually had a little conversation on Twitter with J.J. Zachariasen about this. And if I understood him correctly, he had a better grasp of it. He's already got four years service in. Right. So, basically, this is an option year. So, as far as time goes, I think Gordon actually has leverage that way because right. it's an option year. But I think that's basically it. But we saw that was worthless, right, with Le'Veon Bell. The thought was he wasn't going to sit out all year because he wouldn't get a year credited towards his free agency, and they'd have to do it again. And somehow, remember that changed about week 10? Right. Nobody knew where it came from or understood Right, but why. I think point being is that it is an option right. year. Right, Gordon definitely has his service right. time in. Yeah. Exactly. So he has that leverage, so he can sit out the year be a free agent and go wherever he wants next year, but I, you're probably going to find he's going to find the market soft like Le'Veon Bell did. Exactly. I agree. I smack my microphone around. So I had on the uh, prep sheet, Rick, that Michael Thomas still holding out, but hallelujah, yeah. he got that deal done this morning. Five years, $100 million, the first non-QB to get $100 million on that. And I already see Julio Jones oh. doing a river dance backwards on, <laughs> in and, his and, garage. And Julio <laughs> is in, always unhappy with his contract, and I can just hear Mr. Big Chest out there in Oakland calling his agent now saying, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, <laughs> what's going up. on here? Hold uh, yeah. up. I'm on this crummy team. 
and now I'm not the highest paid guy. What's going on? Do your job. So uh, saddened, but huge, huge for the Saints. I had no doubt that was. They they weren't far apart to begin with. I I thought, you know, his line was always twenty million, and at one point I heard the Saints were coming in between eighteen and nineteen. Right. With with the lack of other at least name brand pieces they have at that position in New Orleans, there was never any doubt this was getting done. But thankfully, sixty one million guaranteed. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's unprecedented. And, of course, uh, I don't know. I, I just don't know what Atlanta's going to do with, with Julio Jones or how Julio Jones is going to handle it. You, you wonder. I, I hadn't thought about that. that. That's an excellent point. Did you know, and I, I wasn't aware of this, in the, his first three years in the league, Michael Thomas is has the most receptions in the first three years of an NFL career. Now, that's not as impressive because right. what it is now, you got to throw out anybody from 2004 back, you know what I mean? Yeah. That aren't going to have those opportunities. But to put it in perspective, he is the number one, and he's clear of second place by almost 40 receptions right. in three years. It is amazing what this kid has done. Exactly. And just for fun to take a stab at all the people I hate, Rick, who do you think's number two on that list? There's your clue. <sighs> I'm taking a stab at fantasy pundits that I hate. There's your clue. Oh, uh-huh. Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry. I was Jarvis stunned Le- to see yeah. him at number the worst fantasy wide receiver ever to live. Jarvis Landry, if you draft him, we will yeah. mock you. We will dox you. We will take you out. He's number two on that list. And, so. and I'll take the – But Michael Thomas, almost 40 receptions clear of him on that the, list. I will take the spearing every time on Jarvis yeah, Landry. Absolutely. Just like we did – on C.J. Spiller, I mean, <laughs> we took punches in the face How many, over we, that. We probably lost 15% of our audience for saying, pump the brakes here a little bit. Yeah. Hold on. It, it was ugly there. It was, it, was re- it was an ugly year <laughs> until we got to about week 10. Yeah. Oh, hold on. You yeah, might well, have been what right. do you know? Well, then it was never, you know, I was wrong, you were right. Look, you're still an idiot. All the numbers said this. This is something. You, you yeah, know, everything, I, everything indicated he was going to be a superstar. All right, we'll do a little rapid fire here. Uh, Tyreek Hill carted off the field during Tuesday's practice. It looks like it's just Bruce a bruised quad. quad no big deal. Everybody losing their mind. This is a biggie, Rick. A.J. Green expected to miss up to three to four regular season games having surgery from a torn ligament in his left ankle. What do you do with A.J. Green? Ah. Uh, I tell you You're what, you're gonna get him in a deal. There is how much not, of a deal do you got to get? There's a not, excuse me, not a lot of Bengals that I am going to be touching for the prices they're going for. Joe Mixon included. I mean, I love Joe Mixon. Don't get me wrong, but you know, we just talked about AJ Green go down. John Ross is gone, but more importantly, center Billy Price, IR, pup list, unspecified ailment, uncertain how much time he's going to need to heal. Guard Alex Redmond suspended the first four games. And you got to, uh, tackle Jonah Williams, shoulder. He's coming back from that shoulder injury on the, on the torn labrum. They're moving him around from, from left to right tackle, et cetera. I mean, this is a piecemeal offensive line. Right. A.J. Green's out. John Ross is out. Not, not that that's a huge deal no. there, but, I mean, it's depth at the wide receiver position. What do you think defenses are looking at? Let's stop Joe Mixon. Yeah, we're going to take Joe Mixon away. I think who will still have success, who I will pay a premium for, will be my boy Tyler Boyd. Yeah. And we saw in the absence of A.J. Green where he can really shine. I saw flashes on him and what I got to see so many times. It's so rare we get to see good football players, you know, other than James Conner recently right. in in Tyler Boyd when he was at Pitt to where when he's kind of the focus of the offense, that's when he thrives, right? Getting him the ball in different situations in different ways. I think with A.J. Green out, I think Boyd does really rise to the top because I, I agree. Whether or not they can remains to be seen. I think Joe Mixon is special. I think he's still – I don't think he – performs to the level a lot of folks are expecting, but he's still uh, exactly know, maybe not at his price, but he's still a, a good running back, a great fantasy running back. But Tyler, you know, you load up on them. You have nobody else of any value at the receiver position. You know, the tight ends always hurt. So, you know, it's Tyler well, Boyd. You're going to find ways to get that a is kid like one, him the ball. That's one issue that I am praying to the football gods. Let me see what Tyler Eifert can do for 16 games. 
I healthy. I would love to see 14, 15 touchdowns. I would I love to see what this guy could do because he, he is a difference maker talent wise on an offense that's already banged up and needs a lot of help. I mean, he's essentially on a touchdown a game pace when he plays. It's just unfortunately he plays so infrequently. So, so what of AJ Green? Obviously, you're going to get a whale of a deal on him, right? Is it even worth touching? Does he come well, back? Is he a that? whale of a deal? That's the thing. Well, that's I guess what. A, what is a whale of a comparatively deal comparatively to what he was well, this time last week? Exactly. It's a whale of a deal. I'm I'm looking late fifth, early sixth on this guy. Right, as things stand, he's saying, well, I may play week one. You're not playing week one. No, no. You just had surgery on torn ligaments. Right, yeah, and that's a that's a long road back. And, look, he's getting a little older. You know, this is not something – it's something I kind of always With a history of foot and ankle problems for years. Yeah, a recent history more yeah. than anything. And so, yeah, I'm – Look, if he really tumbles, you, you never leave that lane. I don't anticipate him coming back and, frankly, having much value. Doesn't this feel like something you come back from a week or two too soon and you keep re-aggravating it, it keeps nagging you? Even if you can get on the field, boy, it's just something that kind of sticks around and it's almost a full calendar year for it's completely right. The uh, the dreaded soft tissues, man. Right? It's, not a, it's not a broken toe or a broken thumb or dislocated shoulder or whatever. It's torn soft tissues that are always moving and – even if they're repaired, they're made. look. You had that torn up knee, right? You know how long it was. I'm still not right. No, well, and you never will be. I'm yeah. sure. This could be AJ Green could be one of these guys that goes from superstar to out of the league in no time. It, it could be. It, I mean, I really believe he's on that road. I hate to see it because he's a, he's a great talent, but the last few years, what was it? dislocate a big toe or something, something. like that it was had dealing. turf toe that was having hampering him he had foot and ankle issues the last couple of years he just and he's not getting any younger yeah and it, it's just th- this feels like especially for this year look i mean if he's hanging around in the 10th 11th round which he's not gonna be I'll, I'll snatch him i expect nothing from aj green this year i think he comes back it takes him a while to get back in the swing. He re-aggravates it. He has his ups and downs with it. You know, it's kind of the thing, although he does feel like he'd be the one that at the end of the year you say, oh, crap, if I'd have played A.J. Green, I'd have won the championship because he's finally going to get right mid-December and he's going to have that one nine-catch, 140-yard right. perform. But I, honestly, I think that's where he's at. He's basically on the, the – But we're going to be getting into probably in a, in a couple of weeks – Two or three weeks once we're through training camp, we, you and I are the more common sense predictors. You know, I don't like to put out, well, the Jets are going four and twelve in April because I, you have no idea right. what these. Te- I tell you what, though, just looking right now, Cincinnati, right now, that's a three three win team. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah. I, it's they are just banged up. They're not very good as it is, and. I tell you what, as much as you like Joe Mixon, they better have something else in that offense right. to play with. Right, well, exactly. So, just a couple more here. Golden Tate appealing a four-game suspension due to PEDs. Appeal claiming it was part of a fertility treatment. He discovered it, ceased use right away, and reported it right away. Think the league owes him any mercy on that? I'm torn on that one. Look, we just saw what the league did with – Tyreek Hill. Well, that, in that context, it makes it absurd. Lord, right? Lord Goodell may increase it to six games for all I know. <laughs> I, you don't have a clue. No. I, I, I really have no idea. And, and when it comes to this kind of thing, I don't look for leniency at all. No. They seem to take this hard line on something stupid when you have very serious charges. Right. Kind of – glossed over because they don't want to damage the shield well that, they don't want about. this kind of mess you know well rick you were smoking dope you're out of here for three games you know because you were at the house watching say but you tested positive right right you know so you're you're done you know we, we don't tolerate this kind of nonsense but this is a little messy they don't they don't yeah. want to bring this up a whole lot and and that's the problem right and and, and 
in a way, I get it, right? You you start making exceptions, then then it gets real muddled. So they're trying to take the hard line stance. These are the banned su- the banned substances. If you take these banned substances, you are suspended this amount of time. However, you spend all the time. You've got entire groups of people employed to do things like this. If this is could be proven true, which I assume it can, then isn't there room even in a CBA for some common sense? If this is true, you know, I, look, I get it. You're an NFL football player. You've got to be aware of every substance and every sub-substance and every sub-sub-substance. The, 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 <laughs> let's try that again. That goes into your body. But come on, you're at the fertility doctor. They say, take this, and then you'll get this desired result. You do it, then you get to looking at it. Oh, man, this is bad. And then you self-report, and there's no room for leniency. You can't give, maybe you give them a game to prove a point, you know, that you got to be more care- But four games, if this is true, four games for that is ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. Do you know what the substance is? No, because I, I, no, I really no. have no I'm idea. I'm way too stupid to understand it. But it was just a component of whatever this fertility drug is. Probably I don't know if I believe him or not. I have no idea. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. It could all be jive, and in, 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 you know he's playing us. But if if it is if it's that, come on, wake up. So from the from the ridiculous to the absolutely absurd, Rick. Last story I have. I'm sure you see this. It is. I don't know <laughs> if this makes me laugh or infuriates me. I, I don't Probably know what both. to make of it. Roger Goodell and three of the officials from the NFC Championship game are set to be (laughs) deposed as part of the ongoing Louisiana State lawsuit brought forth by Saints superfan who seek $75,000 in damages that he promises will be donated to charity. How is this? There's, there's been federal lawsuits that have been dismissed. How is, well, maybe I'm answering my own question, how is Louisiana allowing this to go forth? How? Ow, ow, ow. Because, they, number one, they don't like the loss that they took, obviously. Number two, and more importantly, is it's kind of like, it's kind of like hockey or any other sport. You get a bad call on you, and it, it's proven it's a bad call. It might get a little better when later on down the line, just to kind of make up for it. But a lawsuit? <laughs> or what, they're not going to win it. Well, they, no. They're not going to no, win all, it. All they're doing is they're trying to, you know, now, you know, we get where we're actually going to, we call for Roger Goodell to be deposed. He's not going to go to this. So, all right, it's $75,000 to a multi-billion dollar organization. We're Even trying to, to get, Roger Goodell, yeah, it doesn't matter. We're trying to get him to offer us $50,000 to go away. But this can't be allowed to go on. This is Look, the call, we talked about it ad nauseum when no. it happened. But come no, on. It's just, it it's happened. State, we can't open it up to this. It's the state of the world, Rick. I mean, it's... That's kind of where some, I'm going. Somebody yeah. bumps their head in the McDonald's and they sue McDonald's because... They weren't looking where they were going. Right. You should have had a sign there telling me there was a wall there. And, and some idiot lawyer will take the case because well, if we get a percentage yeah, of I even half of it, of it, hey, yeah. fine. We don't care. It's, it's not justice. It's money. It's like everything else. You follow the cash. And and that's uh, what it's all I, about. I think it's just about I mean, sour I, grapes. Of course it's sour grapes. And that's what it goes back to what I was saying. Yeah, I mean, they may get a break later on in an important game. You I just know. never. Yes, no, you will. No. Yes, you will. So you think a referee is going into the Superdome and is going to have in the back of his head, if I botch this call, I'm going to get sued? So even no. subtly, I'm going to lean no, towards the same. This is, saying, this is I'm junk. not saying sued, but I'm telling you what. One thing, I mean, like they really have to do it with Drew Brees anyway, but somebody lays a hand on him in a playoff game on a fourth and two or something, the laundry will come flying, something of that nature. 
just a little more leniency. No. Bull. Yes, it will. <laughs> how? In, in what, what way? What do you mean, how? In, My God. In what it way is a billion this? dollar machine. No. Where, it, where that works is in the moment when the, the coach is wearing the referee out, wearing the referee out, and eventually, you know, now it, it sort of puts something in your mind. This lawsuit, other than being that this fat nobody who is suing the NFL <laughs> for 75, because as a super fan and a oh, season ticket guy, no. holder, the <laughs> NFL owes a duty to a well-choreographed and well referee. Shut up. Eat another kibasi and oh, die that, as far as I'm tub. concerned. No, I'm not but talking. But to think that this guy can rent any space in Roger Goodell or NFL officials' heads because of this I almost curse because of this crap it is nonsense. No, if anything, if I'm the referees, I'm gonna say, "All right, you want to start suing people? Watch this. Watch this." Go. If I'm spiteful, I don't think a professional referee would do that. They're, they're getting nothing out of this other than this guy looking like a clown and all the losers out there who hate Roger Goodell fist pumping and waving their asses in the air saying, "Good, now Goodell has to answer." Are you kidding me with this? Get this crap out of here. That's all the more reason what I'm saying, Rick. No, this clown's not going to get anything. He's going to get his 10 minutes of fame, and he's gone. He doesn't even have that other than being called a fat loser <laughs> on the Asylum show. I don't even know if he's fat. I just think it's a safe assumption. <laughs> no, I'd like to know who it is. That would be great. Well, they give his name. We yeah, could probably know, look but, him up, but yeah, he's not but, important enough. I'm not even getting him that amount of shine. I'm just assuming I'm probably pic- not even on Google. I'm picturing yeah, him with a natty light in his him. left hand, uh, <laughs> brought worse than the other, and his gut hanging down past his knees saying, hey, Roger Goodell owes me. I should have gone to the Super Bowl. Shut up. He's probably 24 in good shape and a billionaire or something. But probably. I choose not probably to, used to play or yeah, something. I, I choose not to picture him <laughs> no. that way. We have to picture them right. slovenly this, like this we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like to bring people to my level, exactly. essentially, is what it comes down. Yeah, no doubt. All right, no, yeah, I understand else? what you're saying. No, he's, he's not getting anything. I'm just saying that's how things work, even at the subconscious level. And, and, and it does. I mean, and it will. But there, there is on a serious note, you know, now would, and I think that's why the federal courts throw them out, but even at the state level, you've got to be careful in the legal arena with setting precedent, right? Yeah. If, if they let this go on and go, it'll never go to trial. But see, you keep entertaining this, you know, even as, right. as the judge or the court, whoever's making this decision to let it go on because you're still pissed off about that call too. You're setting this present now. Every time there's a game-changing bad call, and it happens twice a week, every week, every <laughs> year, and we allow season ticket yeah. holders and fan bases to sue the league because of the right. You got seriously got to be a little bit careful with it. At some point, somebody can say, "Hold on a minute, yeah, eat another bratwurst and shut up." You know, how about we do that? When you come to our games, we owe you this a game. And right. safety at the game. Beyond that, you've gotten what you're paid for. Whatever else happens on the field is none of your damn business. Take a hike. That's yeah. what we got to do. I agree. All right, you got anything else? Oh, we got tons of stuff. Well, but wait, nothing... Before we get into burning questions, no. do you have anything further? No, well, I do have a nice story that I'll save for later. Oh, all right. Well, yeah, we'll because that. we always like our nice stories to, to, to wrap up a fantastic show fantastic show all right well we are going to start what will i believe be a three-part series mr briggs in uh burning questions at the running back wide receiver and quarterback positions in succession or thereabouts yep. subject to change of course lest uh, this fat <laughs> slob try to sue us as well we're going to start with the running yeah. back good right? luck pal because you're not getting anything you're going to get a couple set of headphones and maybe a beer hey we're, we're putting significant investments back into this uh studio we got some new equipment coming this, this thing's going to sound even better next week i guarantee it or it won't come out if i can't figure out all this new fancy equipment one or the other so it's either going to sound really good next week when we do the wide receiver burning questions or this is the last show and thanks for listening i'm yeah, not sure which what will happen is i'll come in next week and i'll say rick what's up i don't know yeah <laughs> cursing and storming yeah. around we, we've had a few of those weeks so i tell you what you know that studio studio b is is ramping up i mean it is looking good and we will go video sooner or later are you handy yeah see because i'm a loser i can't do anything right i mean and handy in what to like build things 
Eh, somewhat, yeah. We, this is probably something we should do off the air, but what do I care? You know what I'm thinking? You know, we do need to go video. Most folks on the Full Time Fantasy Podcast Network have a video component to their shows. What I'm thinking is we kind of have just a traditional table, right? We use yeah. as the console. Do you think we could build a console? Well, we, I can't build crap, but I could hand you nails and cut you cut boards. Sure. And we could build a console. Yeah. Because I think maybe we like a ser- V-shaped console Yeah, or we something. could certainly build one of them. And, and, you know, even if it looks ridiculous, we can cover it with something as long as well, it's yeah. got the basic shape. And, yeah, we can certainly do that. I just don't have the ability to do anything. Yeah, yeah I've got tools, too. i got tons of I tools. I have tools. I don't know how to use most oh, of them. Okay. I, I usually start projects, curse, fit, throw the tools, and then call a professional. Yeah. I blame my father and my grandfather. Well, your father's an electrician. I think he's very handy. He's very handy. My grandfather was a contractor. I mean, my family is full of people who can do this. So you'd think I'd be able to do it, right? Yeah. It's probably me being a, you know, sounding like a millennial, but it's true. My whole life growing up, because they were such experts at what they did, my job was hand me the tools, get out of the way, put that down, what are you doing, you're doing it wrong. So I never learned how to do anything, but drive to the lumber yard, drive back, drive to McDonald's, pick up lunch, drive back, clean up the mess, put that down, hand me that tool, get me that. So I don't know how to do anything. Yeah, that's the, uh, unfortunately, that's the curse of being the young one, you know, go do this, go do that. But no, we definitely, yeah, we can definitely do that, and we will I'd like to be video before the season's over, quite frankly. Yeah. Whether it'll happen or not, probably not. Well, we've only been talking about it since 2015, so the <laughs> odds would tell us for you stat well, We got guys, a cool poster, though. That is the thing from the 1940s. I Actually, think? no, it's from it's from about 19... Let me think a minute. About 1967, 68, something like that. I was a young tyke. It's a long time. And ago. back in the day, of course, we didn't have computers and all that. You had like a magazine, and you'd see these things. Order, po- they have like little pictures, right? Of oh, I remember those because yeah. those went into the eighties and even the early nineties. Yeah. You yeah. order, you fill Sports out. Sports Illustrated the, always had. Yeah, that. fill out the coupon and mail them in a check, you know, and for two dollars. Yeah, I think it was. About, I think it was. Yeah, I don't know, two dollars maybe, two dollars mm-hmm. at the most. And uh, I mean, it's a nice picture, of Dick Buckus. I mean, it is. It's cool. I like it. What I liked about it, the my, amazing part is, is it's still in existence that many years oh, later. It lasted that long. Yeah. The other thing I liked about it is you left it here in the studio last week, and I brought my daughter to the studio who's entering her teenage years, and I took great joy And when she asked me, well, who is that? And I said, Dick Buckus. She giggled for 10 straight minutes <laughs> at his name. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I, I wish I hadn't matured out of that demo. Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing. Back in his era, even 15 years later, you said Dick Buckus. It wasn't giggling. It was like oh, that, yeah. their eyes got bigger. Like, and like they in just the Lion like, King oh. when you say Mufasa <laughs> yeah. and they shiver. Yeah. yeah, but now she, she thought that was rather funny. Yeah. And then I thought it was funny because she thought it was funny. Thought, yeah, Dick Buckus is kind of funny. I wouldn't say that to his face, but no. that is no, <laughs> what are we doing? In fact, that came up in uh, the show um, Modern Family. You know, the the one son, you know, is the gay guy, and his partner's the, the chubby one, I guess. Okay, he, he was okay. sitting in there with Al Bundy. I don't know what the yeah, name I is never in the watched. show. But, of course, he was a football fan, and, of course, Al, you know, football, they're talking about Dick Buckus. So, of course, the son hears Dick Buckus and thinks they're making fun of <laughs> their <laughs> arrangement. <laughs> yeah. And he storms away, and they're like clueless. They have no idea what to track that down. That sounds yeah, it was funny. How in the hell did we get there? Running back, burning questions, Rick. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's bad. Okay, I tell you what, there is a little bit of scuttlebutt coming out of Tampa. So I think I really think the uh, burning mark that one off. I had the same one. The burning question: Peyton Barber, Ronald Jones. I think I was excited about Ronald Jones about this time last year. He had that kind of hype going. And I I had Ronald Jones shares all over the place. And he's not even active the first couple of weeks. Peyton Barber gets, what, 80% of that team snaps last year? Now, he didn't do a whole hell of a lot with them, frankly, when, when, you, when you look at it. Bruce Arians has said, you know, that the competition's wide open – 
I don't know that I trust either one of these guys. I think, you know, Ronald Jones is going to get a fair opportunity this time around. But Peyton Barber, boy, he's just one of those guys that's always around and always taking carries. And the the next guy they bring in is always going to be the guy, right? And then Peyton Barber just goes ahead and takes 75% of that work anyhow. I don't think either one I trust necessarily. I'd put them, I'd roster them both, but I'm not looking for anything from either one of them. But if I had to pick which one's going to finish ahead, I'm still going to go with Peyton Barber. Yeah, and I think the reason that he's around, like you said, I mean, in your roundabout way, is I just think that his he just has that complete skill set. Right, decent blocker, good out of the backfield, catching passes. Whenever that happens, Ronald Jones, I really like, boy, he reminds me of, uh, I don't know. He just like a little, give him a crease and he's gone. Right. I mean, it's right. just that burst of speed. And, but you have to do more than that. I, and I mean, I love him as a change of pace from a barber. But I, I'm like you. I, I think Barber is the main carrier because you call an audible if he has to pass block. I, th- I think he's more trustworthy that way. And he just, he just seems to be a more complete player. Not saying Jones won't develop, and maybe he does take over more carries as the season progresses, but it was disappointing last year, and it's hard to throw a lot of – these high expectations again right. this year. And I just have to wonder, too. Now, you, you bring Bruce Arians in, that, that may change things. But when you look at the way Tampa Bay is built and you look at who they are, you, you look, you, you've got Mike Evans, you got Chris Godwin, who we all expect massive things for. you got a ton of talent at the tight end position. you got Jameis, who likes to fling it around the yard. I don't know that the running game is ever going to be a priority for Tampa Bay as they're structured right now. So if you're looking at your running game to, which which probably most teams at this point, but you're looking at your running game simply to set up your pass game. You're looking for a pass blocker. You're looking for a guy you can trust in all situations when your real goal is to take a seven-step drop, close your eyes, and throw it as far as you can to Mike Evans that favors a Peyton Barber. You know, it diminishes right. his value even. Say there was no Ronald Jones and we knew Peyton Barber, Barber as the RB1. I think he's still probably in the 20s if, if with that trust with him. How do you develop a guy a guy like Freeman if – I just went completely blank there. Did you see that? I almost yeah. stroked out. Yeah. I, was I said with... Freeman. It was Jones. That, yeah, that was the I'm problem. Like, I don't, what are you I'm, talking I about, I jumped man? ahead to my next question. Okay. So, so now there's your preview for the next question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to edit that little pause <laughs> out of there. That was embarrassing. <laughs> but, but how are you going to develop a guy like Ronald Jones when Peyton – it's not what you want to do anyhow. Peyton Barber fits what you're trying. I just think the way Tampa Bay's constructed. Now, Arians could come in and blow everything up because God knows what they've done hasn't worked. But- well, one thing to remember. I mean, he wasn't the offensive coordinator then, but he was an assistant coach. Um, Ronald Jones is kind of similar to Willie Parker, isn't he? Feels like it. Yeah, that's that's right. You know, they sure uh, turned that guy into a 1,300, 1,400 uh yard a year man yeah so somehow. it's somehow i mean that's just something to put in the back of your little noggin when, when we're talking about ronald jones i think because arians has that that aptitude to maximize a guy like him oh okay i thought you're handing me something I okay get over the mic all right then things got a little disjointed there for a minute some problems in the control room but i'm good now all right rick so as uh as teased here previously as i'm conflating running backs in the league philip Lindsay was one of the biggest surprises in fantasy football last season i believe in ppr formats finished as rb8 if i'm if i'm not mistaken rick you can you can clear clear that up if i'm wrong all of a sudden, this offseason, Freeman, Royce Freeman, who I mentioned in the previous question, is getting a lot of traction in fantasy circles as Denver's lead back. He was 13. 13, okay. 
while Lindsey is being discussed as a pass catcher or a primary pass catcher, what's the deal? Do you buy this? Is it good for Lindsey? Is it bad for Lindsey? Do you buy Freeman? I don't know what to make of this. I one. think you're going to see Royce Freeman, hot, you know, vulture carries away from him. Well, certainly. But I think it's still Lindsey's – he's still going to be the primary back. I, that's – I don't know. I, I What else can you say? I mean, I think that's the guy I'm targeting in right. Denver. Yeah, I, I don't understand where all this Freeman – love is is coming from look he's going to get a lot of carries but i think this is fantastic news with Lindsay. they're talking they're split splitting them out wide receiver a lot now when i say that, every time i say that i roll my eyes how many running backs in the last three years have we talked duke johnson there's there's always a guy in camp they're splitting them out and they're putting them in the slot they're splitting them out wide they're going to do this and then when the when the whistle blows for week one it never happens <laughs> nobody ever does why would you when you have professional wide receivers why would you spend an abundance of time putting professional running backs at wide receiver position so i don't buy this they're going to put them on the field together nonsense we have heard that so many times i'm not buying it so while royce freeman's going to get plenty of carries I believe that if if not considered the primary running back, Philip Lindsay is going to be the primary ball handler for the Denver Broncos. He's going to catch a ton of passes. He's going to get plenty of handoffs. He just looks like that guy. Remember when you say this about Melvin Gordon when he we we and everybody else were sort of mocking him early in his career and the success wasn't there in terms of statistically, but you said, boy, you just watch him play, and it looks like he hits the line so hard, and he looks right. bigger, and he looks stronger, and he looks faster than anybody on that field. Philip Lindsay last year had success, but the same thing, when you watch him run, it's just like, oh, my God, he is so much better than everybody else on this football field right now. Royce Freeman's going to get plenty of work, but at the end of the day, Philip Lindsay's going to be a top you know, 24. He's going to be in low end RB1, high end RB2, and Freeman will be just another guy. That, that's how I feel about this. I think they're both going to be contributors to your fantasy teams. And I think Freeman's going to be worth having on your bench, especially if you're a Lindsay owner. It, it, oh, yeah. If one goes down, if Lindsay goes down, Freeman's going to touch the ball 35 times a game. Well, exactly. Um, I'm with you. I, it's it's Lindsay, but there's a lot of speculation out there that it, it's Freeman's gig. I mean, they actually have come out and said that if you're buying into Philip Lindsay, you're making a mistake. Right. Yeah, that's the narrative right now, and I can't – I haven't heard a reason yet why that makes sense. I, I really haven't. Look, he may be your lead running back, but the league don't – don't operate that way anymore right so he may come in get the first two or three handoffs of the game and then philip Lindsay touches the ball the next 16 times you know i just i, I don't see it i maybe i'm i'm going to be this could be that occasion where i am dead wrong and royce freeman finishes his rb7 and i look like an idiot but man i just don't see it after watching philip Lindsay play last season after watching how he fit into that offense i i just don't see it i, I don't see it at all I don't either. I, I, I'm with you. It's it's Philip Lindsay, and you know, um, my mind's blank. I was trying to bring up a, a point, and but I need to reference someone, and I can't think of his name, so I'm just going to let it slide. Oh, but right. I think it's Philip Lindsay. Very very professional here. All right, you got another one, or you want me to go again? No, oh, I'm I'm good. well. We kind of hit on this one, so I'm just going to let this one slide. If we have to, we'll talk about it. But um, you got rid of that one. Um, Okay, here's a good one here. We kind of touched on Freeman as a handcuff. In your mind, who is the better handcuff? Jalen Samuels, Ronald Jones, or Dante Foreman? Foreman, and I don't even think it's close. Now, with the injury caveat, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah, we're his not, problem. Yeah. If he stays healthy, I think he supplants Miller for that number one spot on that job. I, I really – what is Lamar Miller, 46 years old at this point? I think 
the way Deshaun Watson plays, the things Foreman can do kind of in open space. Look, Miller's going to get I, – I think it's going to be very similar to how I feel this thing in Denver is going to go, right? You know, Miller will get plenty of handoffs, but there's going to be plenty of packages and plenty of plays and plenty of opportunities in open space for Foreman. So I'm not convinced that without a Lamar Miller injury, he's a standalone, you know, RB3 type. Some folks think that. I'm not sure about that. But in terms of handcuff, you know, kind of the point with uh, Ronald Jones was even if he has the job, even if Peyton Barber has the job, I don't care about that either way. So if Barber goes down and it's Jones' job, fine, you want to have him on your roster, but he's nothing He's nothing groundbreaking. And I, who was the other one? I don't even remember who the other one was. <laughs> uh, Ronald Jones, Dante Foreman, Jalen Samuels. Jalen Samuels. Again, same thing. If Connor goes down – He'll touch the ball a lot, but I think Benny Snell gets some work. They'll, they'll sign somebody who played for the Patriots nine years ago, like the Steelers always do. So I think on that list, it's Foreman pretty easily. For and me. I think you're so far off base, you're not what even in the right about? stratosphere. So Dante Foreman off. does not even have the number two position locked up, and he's not going to supplant Lamar Miller, who's, who's 28. I mean, he's not Feels young. like he's been in the league for well, yeah, 16 it years. Seems like he's, he's – you know, Frank Gore's cousin, but you're right. <laughs> well, he might be. <laughs> but, no, I, I think it's Jalen Samuels. And, and I think it's it's not the so much that um, that I think that Benny Snell wouldn't get a, a lot of work, especially if something happens to Connor. But Jalen Samuels' stats last year, pass catching and so forth, way up there. And they're going to use him even if Connor's not hurt. I think Jalen Samuels is much more valuable handcuffed than either one of those two guys. Well, I might not have answered the right question. So, if by handcuff, if you mean if I own Lamar Miller, if I own James Connor, if I own Peyton Barber, who am I going to handcuff them with? Probably Samuels would be the top of that list. But as far as a guy owning a hand, we we put those guys in the handcuff basket, you know, and there's always a guy who likes to dress everybody's handcuffs and then try to trade them for their RB1 in half at halftime of week one. And that guy needs to be shot, by the way, but that guy <laughs> exists in every single league. You know, if I'm just carrying around a handcuff, I think it's Foreman because I think he has the best and most opportunity if he can stay off the trainer's table to take that job over. So not only am I in the stratosphere, I am on point, I am on right, and you can zip it, Rick Briggs. <laughs> not in a million years am I going to zip it talking to a buffoon like you. <laughs> well, fair enough. All right. In the last week, Rick, Le'Veon Bell, your boy, has stated both that he is up for 500 touches this season and issued an apology to fantasy owners for being unavailable in 2018 as if, look, sorry, I I got off the wrong exit. Sorry I wasn't there, but I'm here now. Let me make this right. Basically, he's ready to roll full steam ahead this year. I think we know what his ceiling is, right? What's Le'Veon Bell's floor? Floor? You know, that's that's an interesting question because well, when you I'm think about Le'Veon Bell, you're not thinking floors. Right. Really. I, I mean, any of those guys, Zeke, you know, Kamar, you're, you're really not thinking floors. Right? I mean, you're thinking, okay, this is an not elite Not with Le'Veon back. Bell before. That's the point. I think there is a floor now. Or isn't there? That, that could be your answer. I don't think so. I think this Jet team is – I think there's a lot of people sleeping number one on the Jets and sleeping on a lot of the skill positions on the Jets. Sam Darnold, one of them. I think he makes a huge leap this year from last year in fantasy and as a player, which I guess they both coincide. Robbie Anderson, I look big things for him. If he can just realize he's not Jerry Rice yet. I'm still Robbie Anderson. I need to make my own career. He's got enough weapons. And with Le'Veon Bell there, you don't have this muddled running back position at all. It is Le'Veon Bell. And I think that the Jets, solid second place in this division. They got a good enough defense to, to really give anybody problems. And Le'Veon, the floor, I, I don't even think of a floor with Le'Veon Bell, even even switching to a different offense. All right, let me ask you this. All right. Is there anything in this world you consider yourself elite at? 
and I won't argue with you, so you can say whatever you want. Anything in this world you consider yourself a leader? Obviously not, because I'm a poor slob okay. that you know really hasn't achieved much of anything in life. Fair enough. I really just asked that question to get that answer. Now we can get. No, back I there. will. I will take it back. I, you know what? Because I'm so proud of my children, I think I'm a. Well, I'll give more of my credit to my wife well, for yeah. being a good parent. All right, she's not listening to this. Just no. say it. Come on. All right, so I'm with you. So you're an elite dad. I don't know about that. But so no. if. Yeah, that example doesn't fit. So let's – no. All right. So if you took out of the last two years – Okay. You took over 50% of the expected time you were to be a father away. If you were okay. traveling, if you had yourself a side piece and you were out there all the time, whatever you were doing. When you came back two years later missing over 50% of what you needed to be doing, are you still going to be elite? Well, obviously, that's going. That, that's totally different. We're talking about a what a twenty-five-year-old guy yeah, but, that can get in shape and stay in shape and run a football. He's he has missed Rick over fifty percent, and not due to injury. But think about another. Due think to about it high. another way. Think about it another way. He didn't spend the last year or two years, whatever. He hasn't spent that time. With the Pittsburgh playbook pounding in his head, study learning that. There's nothing really to be confused about. This is all new offense. He's been studying in the offseason, he says, since he signed a contract. Maybe I'm more optimistic than you are, but let's face it. When he was with Pittsburgh and played, what was he? He was an elite oh, back. No. In- and I th- I'm looking for a elite. lot of the same. With the- Maybe not the the, the- – as huge in numbers, especially in the first year with Pittsburgh, or I mean with New York. But if he stays healthy, oh, he's top five. I mean, that's elite. In December of last year, as always happens to us, something come up. We had to suspend operations at the asylum. What doesn't come up? And we didn't bring it back till May. I ask you, Rick, go back to those first couple shows in May. They were pathetic. Any time, maybe he gets to it at some point of the season. What I'm saying is he missed all of last year. He held out for a portion of the year prior to that. Look, he. Yeah, I get the argument he didn't take the beating. I get the argument, uh, any, everything you said. I'm just thinking, boy, when you're that elite at something and you've been doing it every day since you were, what, six, seven, eight years old, then you essentially take a year and a half to do go on a world tour marijuana smoking stripper hanging out with tour around the country, I'm not sure you just come back and be great. And furthermore, everything you said about the New York Jets is right. There's one problem. They're the New York Jets. That's a vortex of suck, just like Cleveland was for that many years, that no matter what you bring in there, within an hour and a half, it turns to crap. It's the reverse Midas touch, right? Everything they touch turns to crap. I think there is a deep, deep floor for this. I really do. I I could see this being a freaking disaster. Well, well, time will tell. Now, what year was it that he um, was, sus- uh, excuse me, suspended? Was that 2016? Uh, it was a few years back. It could have been, yeah. Because he was injured his first year and missed like three games. Then he played a full season. Um, 2015, he only played six games, but I don't remember. That wasn't due to suspension, obviously. Was that obviously. the suspension played well and got hurt late, right before the playoffs? Was that 15? It could have been. Uh, that that's I'm just trying to see. But every year that he's played, he, he's performed. And, I, and I'm just, I don't know, maybe I'm just higher on him than I should be. But <laughs> Pun intended, higher on him. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. You know, you're wrong again, so there you have it. I mean, it's it's great. It's a wonder you can even form words. Do we uh, have plenty of time? Or Oh, no. I think we're uh, we're in OT right now. All right. Well, then I'm going to bring give you a little history lesson. Oh, all right. We're going to wrap her up. Because we, like don't, we don't go anywhere without making people learn, broaden their horizons. Oh, okay. Teaching football. Now, you know what happened on August 21st, 1986? August 21st, 19... Now, you were alive. Yeah, that was in my lifetime. I'd have been, what, uh, nine years old, about to turn ten. No, 
eight about to turn nine. Actually. What year were you born? 1977. Okay. See, I can I can math, Rick. I can math. You can cipher. I do not know what happened on August 21st, 1986. Well, Lake Nios in Cameroon. Oh, okay. Actually exploded. Wait, the lake exploded? In what has to be one of the strangest things to happen to humanity. A limnic eruption. Limnic. Limnic. This phenomenon occurs when carbon dioxide suddenly explodes from deep lake water, suffocating humans, livestock, and wildlife. When the explosion occurred in Lake Nios, a geyser of water shot out of the lake, reaching a height of 300 feet. A small tsunami formed that rushed over the land, followed by a carbon dioxide blast that asphyxiated people up to 15 miles away. Was it Ethel sitting on the porch having her morning coffee and just gets choked to death by a lake? <laughs> what the hell? Scientists, what causes this? Scientists believe limnic explosions are caused by magma pockets under lakes, which leak and cause carbonic acid to form. Degassing tubes were installed in Lake Nios to allow the gas to leak at a safe rate. <laughs> we need a couple of those a, in the studio. <laughs> and hopefully prevent any future eruptions, which I would love to have no more future eruptions from Mr. Flager. <laughs> we need a couple of those degassing <laughs> tubes here. <laughs> so, well, 15 so, miles away. So magma, does that imply like there's a volcano under the lake or something? Well, yeah, that's, obviously. That's insanity. It just blows. I, I don't understand the carbon dioxide. That's like nuclear bomb type of stuff there. Yeah. And, and is, well, I mean, let's face it. Like, I don't have enough to be scared of. No, you worry about lakes blowing up. Well, when it comes to nature, I mean, what what are we? We're we're not. We can't do anything about well, it. Well, that's true. So, I mean, if it if the Earth sooner or later wants to kill us, it will. It's just a matter of time. Well, and nervous, because Lake Arthur isn't but what maybe five or six miles the back end of it from right here. Yeah. Right now, I got to worry about that. Yeah, but it's man-made. I don't really think it's that deep. Yeah. You don't really think you had to worry about magma pockets. Well, I'm going to call my local congressman and see if we can get a couple of them degassing tubes put in there. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we can get some of the leftovers, like I said, for the studio. <laughs> All right, Rick, you done? I'm yep. done. I'm exhausted. Let's get out of here. So thanks so much for joining us. Check us out always, of course, AsylumFantasyFootball.com, at AsylumFootball, AsylumFootball at gmail.com. Check out everything over at Full Time Fantasy. FullTimeFantasy.com, at Full Time Fantasy. Keeps getting longer, Rick. Till next time, we'll see you. Take care.